seven out of ten participants uh, didn't get permanent secure work from it anyway. All right, well, that is the Sunday Papers, and more on that topic now. We're joined by the Shadow Employment Services Minister, Ed Husick. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm sure you're aware that you might be walking away from a, a broadly popular concept. Well, work for the doll the way it is at the moment is not preparing people for work, it's punishing them for not being in work. It's $600 million that has serious question marks over its performance and, in particular, whether or not it's safe. And from our point of view, we need to ensure that we get young Australians working, not putting them through a program that clearly is either uh, got uh, an issue with its safety or an issue ultimately as to whether or not it's putting people into work, skilling them up, getting them ready for jobs. When you say an issue with, with safety, the, the government is absolutely adamant on this, that uh, injury incidents work for the dole less than 1%, whereas across the, the economy it's 4.3%. But there's no way that they could claim, based on the constant reporting of inc incidents, we've had unfortunately one uh, young man lose his life on a work site in Toowoomba back in April 2016. Uh, we've had incidents where young participants have been exposed to asbestos and we're still trying to work out if the companies involved in that have actually been reprimanded um, for putting people in that type of position. And we've had internal safety audits that have said that the work sites themselves aren't meeting safety expectations set by the department. But so the government would say that that's typical of the situation right across the economy and, and in fact um, it, it's not as bad in the work for the doll situation as it is elsewhere. Well, I tell you what, if you're the family of a young job seeker who's in the work for the doll program and you've been told that your child's been exposed to asbestos, you won't be taking much comfort out of the government's defence uh, that's been put forward there. We need to ensure that particularly young, vulnerable job seekers are in environments where they're safe and, importantly, where they feel that they can raise concerns about safety as well. Some of the reports coming out that young participants feel that if they do raise concerns about safety, that the reprimand will be that they'll be basically reported <coughs> to and lose their welfare payments. I mean, that is not an acceptable environment whatsoever. The point with work for the dole, though, is that the mutual obligation thing underpins it, right? Mm. Mm. That you don't get anything for nothing. Now, absolutely. what's wrong with that as a principle? Absolutely. Let's be crystal clear about this. Uh, Labor is absolutely committed to mutual obligation. What we want to ensure is that young people aren't sitting on their hands. Uh, they don't want to be sitting on their hands. They want to be put to work. Um, we will definitely be focused in ensuring that any future program uh, requires that if you're receiving some sort of benefit, that there's a mutual obligation in place. You're skilling yourself up. You're getting yourself ready for work and you're actually prepared to meet the needs of employers but, that but regularly how, tell us... How, how, would regularly it be tell us how, sorry, how would it be different to how it works now? Well, because at the moment, you look at the success rate of work for the Dole Barry and 70% of the people that go through it right now uh, don't get, get themselves in a job just months after being in it. And while we have maintained... When Labor was in office, we had work for the Dole with a focus on on skilling people up, and in particular for those job seekers that haven't had any work experience whatsoever, it's been a useful program. The way it's being managed at the moment, the way that it's been chopped and changed, and the way that it's not preparing people with skills that employers need, demonstrate that the program being managed by the Coalition is becoming a dud. All right, on the Tasmanian election now, and is that one lesson here is that the economy is paramount, and if that's the case, then this might be encouraging for the government at the federal level? Well, I think, uh, importantly, what should be recognised is that in the space of less than 12 months, opposition leader Beck White has forged a very formidable opposition. Um, they're the only party in this election that got a swing to them. It's worth uh, bearing in mind. And I think, from the dealings I've had with Beck White, very impressive individual, and I think in time we'll be attaching the title Premier to her name because she has proved to be a very strong campaigner and I think uh, the government, as much as at both federal and state level, were uh, very cocky last week about their chances. There's one party that got a swing to it. It was Labor. What happened to the coalition? But if she is impressive, she still fell short. And is that because the economy is on the rebound? It certainly is in Tasmania, and, and it is, you could argue, across the board. Well, I, uh, I am very happy with the title of Federal MP and not State Political Correspondent, so I'll let people determine themselves what uh, they reckon were the factors that were at play there. Uh, but the reality is too, and what people did uh, remark upon, is that Labor had a big job. It would have required a seismic shift for it 
to get into to office. And the issue and the concern I got reported to me by federal colleagues was, you know, people were concerned about the issue of majority government, and that uh, probably is is one thing that may have weighed on people's minds going into the polls. All right, we'll go to a federal by-election then, where you do have an interest, and that's uh, Batman coming mm -hmm. up in two weeks. Adani will obviously be an issue there. How can you argue that, that Labor has put a convincing position on Adani to the people of, uh, who will vote in Batman? Because I think we've been consistent, Barry. We have said for quite some time that Adani itself has to stack up both environmentally and economically. We've been making the case that a project as big as this needs to find private sector backers to make it a reality. It's such a distance away from a major port. It's going to require some support and we don't want to see taxpayer subsidies go to this mine when you've got mines operating all over the country without it. So I think we've been quite upfront. The other great thing has been that Bill, to his great credit, has visited um, those parts of northern Queensland, has looked people in the eye, has expressed our reservations about what's been put forward and come up with alternatives to say, look, if you've got 30,000 people out of work between Rockhampton and the furthest point of Queensland, uh, and this mine might generate 1,400 jobs, you've got to work out what you're going to do to generate jobs for the others. And so we've been putting forward investments to help deal with that. And I think, you know, you can see from our point of view, it's been consistent thoughtful and put forward ideas to be able to generate well, jobs. He, he did visit up there and of course with the help of uh, some money from the Conservation Foundation as it turned out. But, but why is it that Labor isn't able to take a definitive position on this, either for or against? I think the people that haven't really given a definitive position, can I say, is Malcolm Turnbull in particular. I mean, have you heard Malcolm Turnbull express clear, definitive support for Adani translated in any concrete way? I mean, they talk generally about uh, in terms of uh, Galilee and they talk about Carmichael, they don't really talk about Adani, whereas Bill and Labor have been quite clear about our position in relation to it. We don't think it should get taxpayer subsidies. We do think we can make investments to help North Queensland. We have announced those investments. And the government, as much as they spruik a Northern Australia infrastructure fund, still haven't coughed up any serious proposal to Infrastructure Australia in all the time that they've had NAIF that would actually help uh, the area generate jobs other than putting all your eggs in an Adani basket. On the Michaela Cash uh, performance uh, this week, and notwithstanding that, do you accept that, um, that all political parties um, ha have an obligation here to just mm. get their acts together? Well, it's not like uh, people race to politics for uh, inspiration in this day and age. Yeah. I think we've all got a job to do to, to lift the standards. I think last week uh, was clearly one of those weeks that was disappointing on so many levels and I think a lot of us were particularly aghast at the way that Michaelia Cash could use a position of power to basically slur and sledge a group of people that don't have an equal platform to respond and register their disgust at the way that they were treated and in particular to not, write, like, to not step forward and say, you know what, I got it wrong, I'm sorry, this was out of line, I shouldn't have said that. And we had to drag that out of her. And even then, it wasn't really a... It didn't give the appearance of being a sincere or, or deeply held uh, apology. We've got to do better than this. And I wonder whether there's a broader question here too, because you, you quit Twitter some mm. time ago and, and you, you described it at the time as the bully's pulpit. Mm. Is the social media a player here? Is the, is the social media, in your view, contributing to, to, to the, uh, I suppose, the deterioration of the, of the debate? I think social media can be useful in being able to build campaigns and for, to bring people together who want to campaign for change. But as others have has observed, it's not necessarily the um, best platform to, to govern and to make serious, considered you know, policy decisions. Uh, I think that we do need to recognise that, in particular, Twitter is just you know, useful if you want to, from my point of view, it's been useful if you want to throw a rock at someone, but is it really something that helps advance the debate or deal with some of the things that, that we've seen. Um, in particular, I think what I'm concerned about as well is in the context of the attacks that Michaelia Cash launched. I mean, you'd expect undignified, unsubstantiated outbursts from Twitter trolls. You don't expect them from a Minister of the Crown. Well, you don't expect it from Kim Carr either, to be fair, and he, when he talked about his opponents as Hitler Youth. I, I, and that was wrong, and he apologised for it, and I think that you know, that's what we've got to see people stepping up and taking accountability. And like I said at the, the outset, in terms of uh, our discussion or focus on this, uh, we've all got a part to play to lift 
the tone and also ensure that people see that politics is actually practically providing solutions to the type of things they want to see fixed in the country. And, and is that what happens with Twitter? You think it just makes consensus more difficult? Well, I think what you tend to find on some social media platforms, and in particular Twitter, is that it's useful if you want to bag someone out, but it's not useful if you want to actually advance an idea. And I think that we've got to be able to... You know, obviously politics, as they say, is robust, and you are going to have to line up and put your views contrary to the other side, and you're going to have to do it in pointed ways. The issue is balance, how far you go, and whether or not social media is just acting as an accelerant to partisanship. I think the other thing we've got to contend with in this day and age is that in the political or media sphere, division is being rewarded way greater, greater uh, is getting much more traction than trying to find ways to bring people together. And while some people might chip me from time to time for being able to set up <coughs> friendships or working you know, relationships with people from different political parties, there's something to be said about encouraging more of that so that we can find common answers that we can agree to, common solutions that do the, the country proud and actually get the job done better. Ed Husick, thanks for your time this morning. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. The Minister for Jobs doesn't have a poker face. If you want to start discussing staff matters, be very, very careful. She just pounced. Because I'm happy to sit here and name every young woman in Mr Shorten's office over which rumours in this place abound. You open your mouth on that, you put up or you shut up. If you want to go down that path today, I will do it. Ghastly. They were sexist. Do you want to start naming them for Mr Shorten to come out and deny any of the rumours that have been circulating this building now? Those.